Hey, we're live. What's up, everyone? I'm here. <laughs> I'm here with the super talented Scott Beersack, who is a good friend of our friend Scotty Russell. So I'm so glad we can make this happen, Scott. Thanks for joining us. It was a little choppy, but thanks so much for having me. <laughs> it's our pleasure. I think it's going to be a really fun session. Just before we jump into that, everyone in the office, let's give it up for Scott jumping on with us. Uh, listen to that music to my ears. <laughs> Um, so we got, we got people jumping on still from all over the world. Some of you are already sharing, I see, but do leave a quick comment. Where are you guys from today? Where are you joining from? I can see Maya is from Denmark. We've got Damon from Detroit, by the look. Nice, right nice. Got Nick from Portland, Sue from sunny Florida, Austin, Texas, Cynthia, uh, Cynthia Jason from Lancaster. What's awesome. PA? I'm being kind of dumb. PA, what state's that? Oh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, of course it is. See, this Brit has no idea. Ah, that's okay. <laughs> from uh, Gloria from Calgary, Canada. Hey, guys. So we got people showing up every second right now. Really appreciate you being with us here today. Scott, what are you going to be teaching us today? What are you going to be talking us through? <laughs> uh, so today, sorry, it's a little, is it echoey for you or is it just me? It's okay for me, actually. Okay. I yeah. can hear literally everything that I say is spot said right back to me. Okay, hopefully we can uh, team. Could we get a little confirmation? I don't think there's any additional windows open or anything like that. Let that me be happening. My, maybe it's me. Have you got a second window open? That could be. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. You got the hangout open. There twice? we go. I did it. I had See? like five of those windows open. <laughs> yeah. Look at this, guys. We've done My this bad. before and spent half an hour panicking and trying to get through it. But yeah, yeah now we know. <laughs> All right. Everything's good now. So uh, anyway, uh, today we'll, we'll ideally talk about the sketch to finals uh, process of the posters that I drew for Atlassian. Um, they're Fillmore inspired. So if you know anything about the Fillmore, it's a very popular music venue in San Francisco that had a very iconic style in the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, especially. And uh, that process was super intense and also a very lengthy process because they had me do, I believe, 10 different posters. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, it was a ton of, a ton of work. And I think uh, there's a lot of work that folks did not get to see. So I'm very excited to show a little bit of the behind the scenes of even just the process of like how to even start something like this. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Cool. By the way, if you see me scribbling, question ideas are going to keep popping in my head. So no, that's I'm fine. Them down already. That's perfect. I love it. Um, cool. And I believe you got like a, a kind of presentation to talk us through today. Uh, I think it's, it's more, not so much a presentation. It's more so just sharing my screen and opening up some files and digging through the Photoshop files and, and, and just oh, sort of talking about it as we go along. Amazing. Um, so I can just get straight into that if you want to. Yeah, that sounds awesome. By the way, guys, yeah. if you're wondering, uh, Scott does not have a, uh, a proper kind of chair, I think, cause they're in the process yeah. of moving. So <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> his laptop's on the coffee <laughs> table. He sat on the floor. I'm sitting so, on the floor. That's right. To kind of have that bond going on. I thought I'd join him. So I'm sat on the floor as well. <laughs> so we're both just hanging out on the floor right now. <laughs> All right. So can everyone see my screen? Okay. Hopefully. Yes, that's perfect. All right. Perfectly. Uh, so let me, uh, let me just open up one of the many posters and then we can talk about the process of one particular, because I know like this one in particular is definitely one of my faves out of the bunch. If everyone can see that. Okay. Hopefully. Um, yeah, cause that's really cool. I wish I had a second screen so I could look at the comment section too. Don't worry. I'll, I'll be the mouthpiece for the people. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so actually let me open up the first things first is that they sent along. Um, so this. Scott, I'm, I'm now kind of seeing the actual hangout chat. Okay, oh, okay. Yeah, we got it now. We got it. You good? Okay. So we yeah. have this um, Google Doc that hopefully everyone can see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they sent a, the client sent along this uh, Google Doc that essentially had all the content for the poster. So they they came up with the names. Um, they came up with the actual like the dates and even just little taglines like, like exclusive merch or tickets at the door, like typical concert um, poster lingo, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these posters also had 
um, like the description behind some of them are actually really funny. Like the one for, uh, I think my another one of my favorites for sheep thrills here, <laughs> it was, uh, it comes from an, uh, an infamous anecdote in a blog post, I guess, from uh, an Atlassian worker that used to work there that worked on a sheep farm for a short period of time. The sheep was supposedly not doing what he wanted it to do, so he punched it. <laughs> so, uh, and then the farmer told him politely, don't punch the sheep. And so- <laughs> Poor that, sheep. Yeah, I know. So that entirety of the, of the story and like the name Sheep Thrills, everything about it just felt super like metal, like a metal band to me. So that's sort of how this poster came about where, you know, it sort of needs to be flames and, and oh, like a ram, cool. you know, a, a ram skull in the background. So it felt reminiscent of a rem of a, a metal band. Um, so that's sort of how a lot of these posters came to be where they gave me this sort of um, the description and I sort of just took that and ran with it. Luckily they sort of gave me creative direction to, or not creative direction, but more so just art direction to, to take it wherever, um, wherever I wanted it to. But of course they, they gave me some good feedback as well. So here is some of the um, process from beginning to end. Uh, it starts out with a really rough sketch that I sent along to the client and I can open it up so it's not moving as well. Um, here we go. So first and foremost is just doing the rough sketch just so that they can get an idea of like what I'm thinking. So I told them like, hey, this is gonna be a metal band poster. This is gonna be flames, this is gonna be type. You know, just trust me, it'll all look good in the end. And luckily mm -hmm. that's exactly how, how the process went down. They sort of gave me the, the trust to, to take it to that final stage that you saw before. This is where um, I get super upset that your rough sketch looks better than my polished MP. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, man. It's all time and practice. And, you know, I've put a lot of hours into this. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't just like magically appear, of course. And it, this, like one of these posters probably took me a good 10 hours or more because um, uh -huh. I am drawing all of this um, by hand on my, uh, I have a Surface Pro 4, which is a little outdated at this point. Um, but it does the job. And uh, so once that's all said and done, like this was a little bit tightened up. This is what I sent to the client, but of course the client has uh, some pretty good suggestions most of the time. And they gave me the suggestion, of course, to give it a bit more depth. And that's how we ended up with more of the, the sort of highlights and stuff that was coming in in this final version. Cause I really liked this flat version. It felt kind of punk, punk rock, I guess. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, wanted a bit more depth and I said, okay, no problem. And I, I really dig both options now. So there's a nice back and forth between working with the clients and, and, you know, the suggestions they may have. And the same goes for another poster that we can get into, which is, um, again, one of my favorites, the radio Walker one, which is, uh, sadly about, I believe the CEO of the company, I think it was up here in the list. Um, yeah, Jeffrey Walker, he was the pre the first president that lost uh, a battle to cancer in 2009. So it's, it's this whole idea for the sort of Atlassian posters was sort of spawned from um, him and the culture that he brought into the San Francisco office um, because he had Fillmore posters hanging in his office and took the gang out to a Giants game, et cetera. So that to me felt like it needed to be this sort of awesome tribute poster to, to Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. So this one started out with a really rough sketch. Like that looks horrible to me, but you know, <laughs> I was like trying to get the idea out. Like I knew it was going to be these literal like sort of radio waves, of course. And it's funny, like I found this picture of like, I, I believe this is like a tree stump or something, which, uh, had this nice texture to it. And I thought that kind of looks like what I'm after. And so I actually use that as the baseline in the background there, oh, wow. if, that, if that's coming up. So that way I yeah. could see some sort of natural organic um, line movement that's happening throughout. And then that's sort of more of a, the refined or at least a more updated sketch to get the idea out uh, and a little bit cleaner, of course. And um, then of course, coming to the final stage, actually I have an alternate for this one as well, which Teresa I can open saying, uh, She loves seeing the process. 
yeah, that's awesome. Know, I'm, what, yeah, what do you guys think so far? Because I get really mesmerized by this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I'm hoping yeah, it's helpful. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Damon said that's a great idea, and I do love that integration of the kind of more natural and organic into the process because right. I don't think yeah. everything should just be inherently digital grids and all that kind of stuff all the time. Oh, for sure. And I think that's the beauty of lettering is that you can be expressive and and you know sort of fluid with it. Um, and you can just obviously do whatever you want. You're not confined to a certain system or anything. Um, so this is how I presented it to the client. They liked it, but they thought, what if it had um, a border around it, like some of these other really cool Fillmore posters by uh, Wes Wilson and some others that are in this Pinterest board that I put together. So they all have these nice um, sort of border elements. There's a few others down here that sort of contain everything real nicely. Uh, and so that's how this uh, updated sketch came to be. If I have it open, probably not. Let me go back and open that one up. And so that, yeah, there it is there. So that helps it feel a little bit more, oh, yeah. I guess a little bit more feel more E and, and more psychedelic E, I guess. Um, Cause that's kind of how a lot of these posters were um, during that time period. So I think this one out of the whole bunch is, is, definitely more reminiscent of the psychedelic sort of vibe that they're going for. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think it's w definitely one of my favorites because it's super typographic, uh, typographically driven, not so much illustration, but allowing the type to do all the work, allowing the type to do the heavy lifting. Yeah. Um, um, Jason just commented saying, seeing people's process helps me approach work in ways you would not think about. So thanks for this. I totally oh, agree. Awesome. I feel like every time I, I get a behind the scenes insight into how another artist works, it's always inherently different from how I would work. And so I just kind of pick up yeah. little bits and bobs. Yeah, that's true. I'm, I'm the same way. It's always awesome because I follow a lot of people on Instagram and you can see a lot of their process through their stories and stuff. And that's super helpful. Mm -hmm. That's so why we do this too, man. Hopefully, helpful for others as well. That's great for sure. Um, so this one, let me show the final first, so I can show you guys how it started or how it finished, I should say. So this one, uh, Young Trinity, is about. Let me open up the the cheat sheet here. I think it's down at the bottom. Let's see. Yeah, so this is about their internal project name for Atlassian's IPO. So I guess when they started selling the uh, company itself, mm -hmm. uh, then they gave out all this info, of course, things to be included. And so I actually started with this rough sketch of like the Holy Trinity, essentially, and wanting it to feel a bit more psychedelic um, with these lines and ripples and stuff again because i think that's super reminiscent of a lot of the what we have going on in a lot, a lot of the um posters from that time period um and so i actually started putting together this mood board first and foremost before i even started drawing like just to get an idea of like okay what makes a fillmore poster a fillmore poster right so you know it's definitely uh the psychedelic lettering um, it could just be something insane like some of these letters, but it could also be very simple with the sans serif, but still feel psychedelic because of the um, composition that everything's sitting inside of. Yeah, and that sort of that sort of gives it that that wonky, strange feel to all the um, all these posters. And so it's definitely typographic driven. It's got this strange sort of uh, warping effects. It's got the really tight, like everything's confined into a nice space like this one. So it's sort of figuring out, okay, figure out the hierarchy, what's most important, what's second, what's third, that sort of thing. Um, and as and well, Scott, have you got a process for how you mood board like this? Or is it pretty organic and you just browse around? Yeah, I, I not so much a, a, a tried and true process or anything by any means. It's mostly just like finding stuff that I know would be fitting for the project. So, you know, of course for this, it was pretty easy. Just type in Fillmore on uh, Pinterest and a lot of this great stuff popped up. So it was just a matter of me d deciding, you know, do I want it to feel this, um, I guess, old or do I want it to feel somewhat reminiscent of the time period but still a little bit modern approach to it and i hope that's sort of what happened with you know some of the posters that i did here it's like i wanted it to feel reminiscent of that but not so much where it's like rooted or at least like in from the 60s 
if that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. So I think that sort of helps with the process there. And so anyway, with this with this sketch, sent that along. They weren't really into this idea as much, so and that's totally fine. So they thought, okay, what if it was more of a hip hop poster? So I I started out with a really really rough sketch again of just like just laying out the type trying to figure out okay what's at the top what's what's most important again second third fourth that sort of thing and then of again going on top of it trying to flesh that idea out a bit more trying to vary up the composition so that it's a bit more interesting rather than you know straight line across straight line across like it just felt very linear mm -hmm. so trying to break that up so Everything's um, separated a bit more like a typical hip hop poster would be. Um, and that's, again, still pretty rough, but then fleshing that out just a bit further. And now the idea is sort of there to at least present to the client and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. This is what the letters could look like. You know, obviously, there's still a lot more cleaning up to do, but at least, um, you know, the overall idea, overall idea is there. And I think it helped sell the idea to the client. And then, you know, from there, there's still so much more work in between like that uh, old sketch here and then the final. Um, How often you know, do you show it, Scott? Like, do you have several rounds or is it they sign off on the sketch and then you go build this kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think it depends on the client. Some clients are very trusting. Some clients, not so much. <laughs> and, uh, you know, luckily with this client, they are very trusting in my process and they knew that I could execute you know, something that looks like this and then turn it into a nice, you know, finished piece like this. Um, and so I just presented that one sketch that I showed here. And then, you know, I didn't show them anything until I showed them the final, um, which is awesome. But, you know, each poster was a little bit different too, because the process was a little bit different um, because each one was completely unique, but still tied together by the same sort of Fillmore theme. Um, so, you know, it's going to be, it's going to vary depending on the client, but this one turned out, you know, nice without uh, any additional rounds of, of sort of guidance from the, from the client, mm -hmm. which is great. Yeah. we got Angela in the comments, loving the colors. That's awesome. Let, yeah. Let and a lot know. of these, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, let us know in the comments guys, um, if you've got a favorite design so far. So which ones have we, we got, we've got the we've young, got Trinity. The, we've got young the, Trinity, the radio, radio walker. Mm -hmm. And uh, sheep thrills so far. Yes, and, uh, let's... sheep thrills with the fire. Yeah, sheep let's thrills is Jesse's to... favorite. She said. Yeah, that's one of my faves too. I I listen to a lot of metal, <laughs> so <laughs> it was super uh, super fun to draw that poster because I like I don't get a chance to like do stuff in the in the sort of that realm at least. So it was nice to to give that a shot. Nice, Lily likes so radio walker. One, Sheet Thrills is popular with a bunch of people. Angela says she needs this poster for her teens, saying, clean your room in these bright colors. <laughs> there you go. Potential client project for you there, Scott. Love it. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. Hit me up. Uh, so the next one, which is another one of my favorites, is uh, it's called Cease and Desist, which also has a really great backstory to it, which, it, which ultimately guided the direction. Uh, so... Supposedly, uh, FedEx has something called Ship It Days, uh, and FedEx sent them, in the nicest way possible, a cease and desist. Um, okay. I don't, uh, so I don't know, I don't know why, but uh, that also felt very reminiscent of like a metal band poster. So I thought, okay, I never get the opportunity to draw snakes, so why not take this opportunity to draw a snake? <laughs> and that was literally that was. Was literally it that's what guided this direction like i i never get the chance to draw some sort of like brutal animals or brutal reptiles and stuff that are associated with metal or rock and roll or whatever um and so that's the original sketch that i sent them i thought i told them like look this isn't fleshed out by any means but there's going to be a snake there's going to be type it's going to be great and i sent them the sketch and you know somehow there there sadly isn't much others um uh, like process in between that I saved, mm -hmm. um, but it, it it eventually ended up turning into you know what you see here. It took this one took the longest I think, just because of the That's amount nice. of all the scales and the highlights. Like I'm I'm drawing all this by hand, so I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not like um, 
using any texture well the background here the pointillism is is definitely a brush but everything else like i'm i'm drawing yeah i was gonna say you go crazy if you were doing those points individually yeah oh for sure like i did that in art class like in high school and i i mm -hmm. did not want to do that ever again i did it in <laughs> i did it in art class too <laughs> and then a girl in the year above me came along and just drew a line across it and i'd spent like three days oh, like, oh yeah you're kidding me. <laughs> That's I think the worst. this one might be my favorite so far and I think it looks the most authentically old like they, they all look super That's authentic great. I mean genuinely I thought that was something off your mood board when you showed it and I was like oh that's wait you, you did that like yeah and crazy. so and that's good to hear because like when I go back to this mood board I, I always am referencing like okay how are they containing the type like how does the type look like even with this one especially it kind of looks reminiscent of that snake and how the type just forms into you know, whatever the um, container is essentially. Yeah. And so that's kind of what I, I, I told myself, okay, I'm going to have this snake here. How does the type fit into the negative space? Mm -hmm. How does everything else look? And that, that sort of just felt pretty fluid and it was a nice uh, opportunity to draw in a little snake eye in the O too. So that felt perfect. Seriously, we might need to have a conversation after this because we're about to move offices and get some killer artwork for the new office. So we might need to talk quotes after oh, this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm totally like, down. Awesome. I, I love this. Honestly, this is one of the favorite posters I've seen. I almost want to screen grab it and then like put it into the uh, the Pinterest board just to see how it looks in comparison. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know what that's I mean? actually a really good idea. Yeah. See if it fits in. Um, this was another one that took like just hours and hours. Oh, whoops. What happened there? Did I? Are we, am I still screen sharing? I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see right, Pinterest. Cool. Um, just want to make sure. All right, so let me open up. Uh, this one's called Mojito Love. Well, I do me, love mojitos. Let me open up the sketch real quick, which actually I think looks completely different, or at least maybe somewhat similar. Let's see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's pretty close. Enough to get the ideas across. Yeah. Um, let me group all these. So you can see, like I even took just an image of Cuba in the background and just drew on top of it. Like it's not, uh, I, at least for an illustrator, you don't have to, you can refer from things in, in real life, of course. Like it's not, you don't have to come up with everything like from, from the top of your head. So that's kind of how those buildings came into play, at least the size and scale of everything. Uh, and so uh, same thing, I, th I thought, okay, this has like this sort of Cuban theme to it. And let's see, I believe somewhere on here, on the deck that they sent me. What did Mojito love? What was that one about? Uh, Mojito love yeah, they, Getting some love in the comments, by the way. Uh, awesome. People liking awesome. It. <laughs> That's good, because that one took the longest, so it needs the most love. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they would host a shindig. They would like have this sort of event, I think, and like you know have uh, an auction, ramen competition, trivia night. Um, and so that's sort of how that one came to be, especially the name Mojito Love. It's just sort of felt Cuban, of course. So the rough sketch is, is definitely rough, but enough to get the idea across again. And I think, oh, I wish I had the other sketch of what the buildings look like. Like I had to redraw these buildings a number of times because the line work was either too fine or too, um, too blown out. Right. So I had to redraw the buildings a number of times. I had to redraw the type. And this one, especially with the type down below, I wanted this type to essentially be the, the shadows that are cast from these buildings. Um, so they felt like a solid block of color, but also still feel, of course, reminiscent of, like, this is like the actual psychedelic lettering, like That's more okay. along the lines of, of the 70s look, but still, still ideally readable. Um, some of it, it, it definitely takes some like staring at to read some of it. And that's, that's exactly how that, that should be. I think that's yep. totally fine. It's very cool. I just saw uh, Sue Hall in the comments saying, seeing these bring back some memories. Uh, I mean, I'm not too old. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was, that was the Mojito love. Uh, let's move on to, let's do, yeah. This one's pretty nice too. I could look at this stuff all day. By the way, Scott, you might have noticed I'm off the floor. I am a 31 year old man. I cannot sit on the floor for an hour because <laughs> my back was seizing up. Yeah, dude, that's I'm getting to that point right now. 
well, no worries. Let me know if you need to stretch your legs. You could do a a, a lap of the room while I keep the you know the viewers entertained. <laughs> if you want. Get that circulation going. That's perfect. I'll I'll let you know. I'll keep you posted. Okay. Um. All right. Here we go. This one's called One Kind of Cheese. Ooh, and uh, that's nice. Yeah. I mean, this one felt. Uh, and let me show the original here. Let's see. Where is that? So I actually, this started from a typeface from uh, my friend James Edmondson. Uh, it's literally called Chi. It's a variable font that you can mess around with. Um, so if you guys wanted to check that out, by all means, definitely, definitely look up his work. Um, but it actually started out, okay, 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 all, let's do that. There we go. There we go, yeah. So you can see I had these, like, I wanted it to feel sort of like these, like, psychic hands oh i erased it yeah so like these little hands that are holding this cheese almost like they're like holding a psychic ball mm -hmm. or a magic ball um and then the grilled cheese in there again just using reference images as well because i can't draw hands i mean i, I know drawing hands is one of the hardest things somebody has to do so that was a good starting point at least to get the everything in the right position how do you conceive of some of this? I mean, are any psychedelics involved in the conception phase? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, not for me. No, it's kind of just like, it's kind of, for me, it's kind of just figuring out, okay, what do I want to draw? And how do I obviously tie that back into the Fillmore aspect of it? Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of how the process goes. And then, you know, I knew that I wanted to use a typeface similar to this, but I thought, okay, what if this grilled cheese is literally be pull, being pulled apart? And that's kind of how it was conceived here. If I turn everything back off, you can see the nice. uh, yeah the grilled cheese essentially being pulled apart by this psychic hand. But we we ended up going obviously in this direction without the hands entirely and just having the grilled cheese be its own thing. Um, and it's a lot more uh, I think uh, structural and it works better on its own without the hands. So I think it worked out nicely. But they gave some great um, suggestions for that as well. And I think I have more of that process on, I wrote a little blog post on my site, which has some of the process as well. So you can see that step-by-step -step process. Oh, that's cool. Um, so just going from rough sketch to adding some highlights, and then of course making the jump to the, the finalized sort of colored in version. And even just the type changing to fit in to the space. Like yeah. I even had the dates completely wrong. <laughs> um, but you know, that's just how it goes and, and it sucks, you know, being a lettering artist, you, when that stuff happens, you have to essentially redraw everything. You can't just like type it out with a typeface, of course. Yeah. Um, Our uh, well, creative director, Matt is watching from home. Normally he'd be here with me, but he couldn't make it today. And, uh, um, no worries. Yeah. He's like, sorry. He couldn't be here in person, but he's loving how vibrant your work is. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. Uh, let's move on. Let's go to the next one. Why not? Uh, so this one, I don't know how this idea spawned. It's essentially just like a calendar of sorts because on Tuesdays they would go to this place called, uh, I believe it was actually called rumors and, uh, they would go get what are called, uh, what are they called? They're like nacho, nacho. Let me find it because it's so weird. Okay. It's something, it's something you would never eat. You said rumors. I'm getting Fleetwood Mac vibes. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Tater tot nacho toppings. So it's like the like the tater tots are the chips, but with nacho toppings. <laughs> so I don't know. It sounds it sounds crazy. And so I thought, okay, it kind of needs to feel maybe like a calendar. Maybe again, letting the type do its thing. But then the branding for this bar called rumors was very dark and very like black letter E. So that's sort of how this spawned was like allowing it to feel reminiscent of the bar itself. So there's a lot of like sort of little behind the scenes research that happens um, to allow it to at least make some connections and at least tie everything together. So I think this was based on their, their sort of branding and their color scheme. And then of course adding in, um, more of that psychedelic lettering to tie it all back together and to fill up the space real nice. I'm getting so, like um, tarot card vibes from the Oh, colors. perfect. Yeah, that works too. <laughs> I, I really dig how the sort of like these, all these feel like little tiles and um, 
And also sort of, again, trying to go for that calendar feel where you're like crossing out the days. So yeah. you can't wait till you get to that Tuesday where you can go to rumors and have your tater tot nachos. <laughs> <laughs> they sound good. Some people in the comments are like, it sounds crazy, but they're amazing. Yeah. I've never had it. It sounds like a heart attack, but I don't know. <laughs> I have to try it. Hey, you're from Alabama. We went um, there for uh, Creative South recently. There was a lot of heart attack food going on. Oh, it, yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. Down there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, the next one uh, called the Graphic Tees. Let me open up the final again so you can see how it turned out. And then we can talk about the sketch. Because so I think that's helpful to see like, okay, so here's, yeah, here's the final. And so this one definitely feels more reminiscent of that psychedelic lettering as well. Um, and allowing each of these clouds to be its own separate thing. Um, and the whole idea behind this one is that it's always a joke that they've been mistaken for a t-shirt factory. So like that one was pretty obvious to me. I said, okay, I'm going to draw a factory. And as for t-shirts, anything printing related is usually CMYK, of course. So it just felt fitting to have this factory feel like it's literally printing colors <laughs> uh, all the time. And so, you know, the rest just sort of fell into place. It was just a matter of drawing in the the smoke. And so here's that rough sketch. Like that, that was enough to get the idea across to the client. I told him like, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Like somehow the type will fit into this smoke here. And you know, it, this one also took a good deal of time. Like actually here, I have a rough sketch in here, which is really rough. Like this is actually drawn in my, in my notebook. So like just enough to get the idea out of my head. Like I thought, okay, here's this little, like this is probably the size of a quarter or smaller or something. Mm -hmm. Just enough to get the idea out. And I thought, okay, what if it says shirt on here? And what if the window itself was actually a shirt? But that was a bit too much, I think. So I toned it, toned it down a bit more. And I that's always, um, okay now. Scott, I always wonder when you're trying to fit a certain number of letters and words into a space like this how do you yeah. do that because i tried to do that and then you kind of run out of space and like do you yeah, literally just true. sketch it out and do dividing lines or what yep uh i wish i had some of that process but yeah so i would essentially draw out you know your your cap height your baseline your x height your typical um guidelines that you would need to align everything so that everything like flows within the same uh composition at least and then sometimes, you know, if I'm drawing something out and yeah, like you said, if it's too, too long or too short or whatever the situation is, I'll have to, you know, that's just the case of lettering is just redrawing it. So, you know, I even ran into this issue here of like, well, how do I fill this space? So I just drew this strange, like wobbly line to continue your eye down. Um, because in, in certain situations, like you can't make it all work. And so you have to just sort of improvise in a way, I guess. But, you know, that happened many times where you'd fit a whole thing in here, or maybe I just wrote the word November with, uh, or hyphenated, or um, with, a, with a period after, rather than writing out the whole word November, so just N-O-V. Um, and that, you know, maybe felt like it was too bold, so then I, you know, erased the whole thing and then drew out November to, to fill the space a bit better, so. It's definitely a constant back and forth um, with any of this because you're always just like erasing and going back because like you're you're drawing it all by hand. So that's the downside to it all. And also with the legibility, I think with this psychedelic style, you're kind of pushing the boundaries of what's legible. And oh, with yeah. all of these, they are legible. Like sometimes you might have to look a little bit closer. How do you tread that line? You know, do you do you push it as yeah. far as you can until you literally can't read it or yeah no that's that's a good that's a good question i think a lot of it comes down to use case and where this this thing is living so obviously in this scenario since these are posters you can get away with uh letters being like unreadable um because you know that it's going to be at such a large size that people are going to sit there and stare at it ideally um especially if it's hanging up somewhere you can sit there and and try and figure out what it says um, but for me, like I want to make sure that some of these letters definitely read as those letters. So, you know, some of these are actually probably difficult to read as the letters that they're supposed to be like a D here, for example, mm -hmm. like I know it's a D because I drew it, but you know, if somebody's seeing it for the first time might not know it's a D just because, um, that's just how some of those letter forms were drawn 
um, especially in this in this time period. Like some of them are are definitely difficult to read, but I think that was like the point of it, so that you could at least um, ha it has like more of a visual interest to it, and it's definitely filling the space in a unique way, um, so that it feels more of like a solid block. But once you look at it uh, closer, you realize, oh, this actually says something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's sort of very cool. Yeah, that's sort of the the vibe that a lot of these have at least like that's even some of these in here uh, I won't I won't open it, but it has that I had that it had that D in there. That was um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there it is like some of them are, are very hard to read. Uh, yeah. And the H in there too looks like a backwards N I think it just goes to show you how a proper mood board and research phase can properly inform yeah result, because your end result looks so authentic to these and obviously if you hadn't have laid all that groundwork of research it wouldn't oh. capture that. yeah for sure i agree the research is like the most important stage of the process because you want to make sure that you're you know of course delivering exactly what the client is asking for and of course being uh cognizant of you know the the time period and and so much of that history that is involved with this this project in particular especially because there's so much history involved with the film or itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's very cool. By the way, guys, one... don't, don't be shy in terms of using the ask a question. So oh, right yeah. below the video, there's an ask a question button. Uh, Deborah just put a question in saying, what are the standard poster dimensions? Uh, that's a good question. I think it varies. Like, you know, it could be 11 by 17, 13 by 19, 18 by 24. There's definitely a lot of um, standards uh, in regards to poster design, but there isn't like one size fits all type of thing, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Um, where's the bobbleheads? Let's find that last one. <laughs> this bobblehead. so this, oh yeah, employees get their own bobblehead on their 10 year anniversary. So I thought that was really cool of them to do that. that is cool. um, so this idea is literally just completely random. It has nothing to do with anything other than the fact that the astronaut sort of feels like a bobblehead for is that I wanted to do something space themed and you know that's kind of how this project uh, sort of spawned off of everything is that everything was like up to me to decide okay what do I want to draw but then also how do I tie that back to the original brief so you know sometimes that's the beauty of of uh, client work is that you know they might trust you enough to allow you to do your thing and that's kind of how this sort of happened is that they knew that I was capable of doing it and they were open to me exploring my ideas. And so I, it was like a, the best project you could ask for because like how often do you get to draw a bobblehead spaceman in space with like this <laughs> beam of type essentially coming down from it. So I'm it, guessing it, that no one watching live has probably ever had that project brief. <laughs> yeah, right. like it's such a rare opportunity. So like you have to take those opportunities to not only help the client, but also explore yourself, like and explore what you like and explore what um, you haven't had a chance to draw yet. So that's yep. sort of how this came about was that like I, I knew this type again would have like this strange wavy baseline and it'll feel um, reminiscent of some of those uh, film war posters. And so that's that really rough sketch. And then again, fleshing it out and, and cleaning everything up so that it's all nice and readable and and uh, you know, create some nice ligatures and stuff because you know when you're drawing all this stuff out, um, you run into like what we were just talking about, running out of space. And I definitely ran out of space around here, but tried to make it all work as, and and squeeze everything in so that it's still at a decent size and still um, readable as well. It's really cool. Um, Lily says these are so great, Scott, and you are so talented. Got, <laughs> Thank you so much. We've got a lot of people fanning out in the uh, in the comments. Thank you. I think it's there's... cool. I mean, I, I would love to know in terms of color palette, like I've seen your work before, of course, and what's always mm -hmm. struck me is just the boldness, the vibrancy. This one's not even like so vibrant, but it's just such right. a distinctive, like deliberate, confident use of color palettes. Right. How, yeah. how, how did you get there? Because I think color is something a ton of people struggle with. Oh, for sure. And I, I struggle with color just like everyone else. Um, it's luckily with this project, uh let me i wonder if they have the link in here somewhere they essentially have a link on their site it's like atlassian something about their brand colors essentially mm -hmm. um so they gave me essentially all the colors that i could pull from 
And that's sort of how a lot of the posters came to be, the colors that they are. Yeah. A lot of these colors are just from their brand, especially. But then it's just a matter of like figuring out, okay, um, is there enough contrast between the colors and like your typical color rules that you have to pay attention to? Um, so every project's definitely different. Luckily with this one, they provided me the colors, they provided me the content, and it was just literally up to me to decide like what does everything look like? So that was like, again, the best, the best project you could ask for, honestly. Yeah, uh, that's, that's such an awesome project. Did you actually go to the final event? Uh, no, I did not. No, oh. I mean, well, so all these, all these posters were printed for their headquarters and then okay. they're just hung up on a wall alongside some original um, film art posters and maybe some other artists that drew some uh, posters as well. Uh, so cool. okay. I, I thought they had like a company event that they were relevant. No, for. no. So these are all just like, just to decorate the space kind of just to like, cause they were moving into a new office and they wanted to decorate the space very film or esque like nice. so, and they cut, they commissioned me to do some custom work. So, um, but yeah, here's the last one. This one's called power to the meeple. Um, I think regarding this one, they have these little illustrations that they have across their site that are, that they call meeple. Yeah, they're actual people elements from our illustration library. So they have a library of, of illustrations that other artists have created, and they call these little people meeple for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, I don't know why I went with this uh, sort of vibe of like books stacked on top of each other. Maybe it was just like, I think it was more of the idea of knowledge is power, and that power is given to the people. So I think that's sort of how this idea spawned, is that I wanted to emphasize that using the the books themselves but they thought it felt too much like a book club or something so and that's totally fine and that's sort of how this rough sketch started i thought okay what if it was just like this giant sign um standing on top of a building and that sort of turned into what you see here i mean this one also took a good deal of time trying to fit all these letters even like fitting a w into the window of you know something next to an o like the window is slight Large fit that W in there, like just those <laughs> little nuanced things of uh, just so you can like fill the space and still have it look and read um, nicely. Uh, and so yeah, that one tied together real nice as well. And just having those little light bulbs and stuff, neon sign sort of vibe, and like these little people are putting together this sign, like carrying the little light bulb to this guy so that he can put it up on the sign. And, and I can't. Said, oh my god, you've got the dots lined up too. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little uh, perfectionist as well sometimes. So that's sort of how a lot of that came to be. Um, but yeah, I, that's, that's, I can totally it. see why you're friends with Scotty Russell. Whenever I see his stuff and his stories, I'm like, that is the most meticulous process I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, I can get pretty meticulous about that stuff. And like, you know, I wanted this end project to be a really killer portfolio piece too. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Luckily it has been like I just this past week, I had two clients reach out specifically wanting Atlassian styled posters or at least Fillmore style posters or at least like a, a concert poster of some kind. And that was at least they knew I was capable of doing the work because I had that project on my portfolio site. So it has helped a ton with my like freelance career overall. Well, we say it on the show all the time, but produce the work that you want to get hired for, right? Exactly. I agree. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I mean, speaking of getting hired, you've got a pretty unbelievable roster of clients, I would say, looking through your portfolio. And I'm yeah, sure a lot of people are, are kind of wondering, like, you know, how do you land such, uh, such amazing clients? Because that's the dream for everyone. Right. Um, that's, that's a question I get a lot and I get it often. Honestly, there's no, I don't know, there's no like, easy answer of like, this is how you land a, a huge client. Um, it's more so kind of going back to what you were just saying of like doing the work that you want to do. When you put a lot of yourself and a lot of uh, what you love and a lot of effort, of course, into your work, I think clients just naturally, of course, gravitate towards that and they, they, uh, they can see that. But you have to also put yourself out there and at the same time. So you like, you can't, do this great work, but then like keep it to yourself and never share it. I think a lot of my success has come from 
just the age of social media um, and getting getting onto Instagram at the right time, getting onto Twitter, Dribble, Behance, you know, all those social sites where you can post your work because a lot of those clients are referencing those sites to then hire illustrators or designers or whoever to then to then do that work. So, you know, it's not so much it's it's doing the work, but also putting yourself out there. And I know both yeah. of those things are very difficult to do. Um, even for myself, it's there's many days that I'm like, I'm sick and tired of social media. And I'm sure most people are at this point because of just the nonsense involved with a lot of it. But there's also, of course, a lot of um, benefits. There's a lot of pros and cons, of course, but there's a lot of benefits. Uh, and of course, my career and the ability to to, to be full-time freelance for, I think, going on like four or five years now. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do that without social media, so. Would you say social media is where you get the majority of your inbound client work from then? Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely say so. I think when I share stuff on social media, clients find my work and then, um, you know, shortly after I post something, maybe it pops up in their feed and they think, oh, I have this project that would be perfect for Scott and they reach out and, you know, a lot of my relationships that I have started with folks have definitely spawned or at least started on Instagram or Twitter or, or any of those sites really. So social media has definitely been the, the catalyst to, you know, project my career into what it is now. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful for social media. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> um, so have, have you, like, do you ever, and have you ever had to pitch yourself um, in the sense of like a cold pitch, you know, I would love to work with you guys or has it been more organically putting work out there and, and waiting for the people to come to you? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people think, uh, maybe it's just because of the numbers that are involved with my social following like that. Oh, they think, Oh, I have, you have 45,000 followers. You must be getting work left and right, but that's not the case at all. And I know that's the same for a lot of my uh, friends on social media that the numbers don't really matter but at the same time the the numbers sadly do matter to some clients because they know that um, you know if it's an advertising company or some some sort of uh, agency or studio that's looking for work to then spread that work to more people if you have yeah. more following it yeah it just makes sense um, but for me pitching work I have done a lot of cold emails so just like searching up people on LinkedIn or searching up companies, finding the people that work there, sending them emails. But I also don't, uh, I do more of like a handwritten note sort of thing. Like I try and find their address so that it's more of a personalized um, sort of approach rather than just like, hey, you should hire me. You know, it's more of like, hey, I really enjoy the work that you're doing. I, I know what, what you're capable of. I know who you are. And, and giving it that personal touch of writing them a handwritten note, like who does that? Not, I mean, in this day and age, probably not many people. I love that, and I want to stick on this for a second. Do you um, do you also include like samples of your work with that handwritten note? Oh, sorry, you chopped you chopped up a little bit. What what was the question? Oh, we, again? We've done so well until now. Um, I know, yeah. just until that one point. Um, yeah, I was saying, did you include um, examples of your work with that handwritten note? Oh yeah, of course. Like I I make sure to you know I put together a little zine or a little. Um, some sort of leave behind so that they would ideally keep that thing on their desk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's a letterpress, like my most recent one was a letterpress print uh, that I gave out at the start of the year. And, you know, ideally it's something that they want to keep and not necessarily throw away. Um, yep. And so I'll, I'll send them that, but with also the handwritten note that says, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of your work. I love your work. You know, hopefully we can work together. If not, here's my work. You know, hopefully you can enjoy it. Hopefully you can hang it on your wall or whatever, whatever the situation is. I think that at least, even if they don't reach out to me, they can, they can at least know who I am or at least be reminded that I exist just mm -hmm. because they have that, that leave behind on their desk. So that's smart. And, um, I don't know if you've ever listened to our, our main podcast, the honest designers show at all, or if you're aware of it. No, I, ha I am aware of it, but I haven't listened yeah. to it yet. So we like to really kind of, uh, dig deep into issues like these because i think people really appreciate like the tangible you know step by yeah. step so i think oh, um sure. that's amazing so you do a handwritten note to stand out you include a sample of your work that isn't something people would just throw away it's more permanent. Right. um 
what do you do? Do Even you just... actually address it to like the key decision maker? So it's obviously not to the company as a whole. Do you pick out one person, right. make sure it gets to their desk? Exactly. Yeah. So in the in the case of the work that I do, you usually want to hire or at least aim for the art director or the creative director, sometimes a senior designer, because that senior designer can then push it to the art director. And, you know, there's that conversation that can happen. But uh, I aim for those types of people. And I even like on the envelope itself, I'm handwriting all the envelopes, too. Like it's a lot. It's a ton of work because, you know, even with uh, how you can mail stuff out, you can go on to your whatever account type up the address and have your you know machine printed out and then you attach it to the envelope and or you know it's like a little sticker and yeah. so just customizing every aspect of that thing so that they know you put a lot of time and effort into it and it's not just like this churn and burn like hey i need some work hey send me some money essentially is what you're saying yeah. like so you know you have to you have to put in the effort to then get a project in return mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think it definitely has helped. I'm such a believer in that. And, um, like I say, we've talked about that on our main podcast quite a bit. I think it's so relevant, yeah. not just for pitching potential clients, but for trying to land a job because there's nothing yeah, worse exactly. than an employer when you get the same CV that you can tell has been spammed out to 5,000 people, super generic yeah. to whom right. it makes own kind of thing. Yeah, um, exactly. Like one of my biggest business mentors and inspirations who i kind of follow his stuff online he actually got his investors for his company that way because he realized if oh, he just wow. sent out an email not only was that super generic and they were probably getting hundreds of thousands of emails every day these important yep. people um, but they hit the gatekeeper so they would hit the pa or whoever looked after that inbox and it would never reach right. so he sent out handwritten notes in golden envelopes because it would stand out nice. so yeah um, exactly the same approach, but like it really, really works. And most people just don't want to put the work in to actually execute that. Yeah, that's exactly it. And it's just, I mean, I know it's like, I know it's time consuming because believe me, I've, I've spent hours doing like sending out, even just sending out a batch of like 50 is easily like 10 to 20 hours or so because it takes so much time doing all the customization of each of those things. But I think it all pays off in the end. At least if you if you get in touch with the right people, like I know I know it's worked because I've seen the the reciprocation of it at least, and yeah. and you know it's just a matter of putting in the time. That's it. Love it. Um, I would say as well as quite a distinctive color palette, you also have a very developed distinctive style. And I'm not just talking about like the film or stuff. I, I would say your whole Instagram, your whole portfolio. Mm -hmm. you're one of those designers I, I put you up there with like ian barnard and friends of us like that where i could see the work and i would know it's yours without seeing your name that's awesome how, <laughs> that's great how, to hear how, how do you get to that point because again i think that's something a ton of people struggle with where they're quite inconsistent stylistically yeah i think that's a that's a really good question and i honestly don't know if i have the answer to it because i always attribute like i would i would tell myself that i don't have a style um, because if you do, you're essentially doing that thing over and over for clients, right? Like if a, if a client is thinking, oh, I, I need an illustration, I know who the right person is, I'll hire this person because their style fits that project. It makes sense, especially for some illustrators where they definitely have a style where you can see like that is prevalent in their work. But for me, I try to, I think my style is that I'm focused within typography and illustration and I try to vary it up enough so that I'm still within those realms, but the typography is always different. The illustration is always different. Like I try to, I try to branch out so that I'm not, you know, niched into one specific, you know, execution, I guess is the right word for it. Yeah. You know how like, you know, just like flatline illustrations or watercolor or something like that. That's like a style to me, but I try not, but anyway, to get back to your question, uh, to, to develop a style, I think is ultimately, it's ultimately somebody else that's putting that style on you, you know, you know because you don't know that you have a style until someone says, oh, that's that person's style, mm -hmm. right? Like it, it, in my mind, that's sort of how it is. Like somebody else is the one clarifying that you have a style. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think maybe once somebody points that out, then it's then it allows you, the illustrator designer, to then realize, oh, oh, maybe I do have a style. Maybe I should explore it some more. And it's kind of just like a lot of practice and exploration on your own part. It's not so much 
it just happens and you're like, oh, this is it. This is like, this is what I do for the rest of my life. Yeah. Like, nailed it. Um, right. Yeah, I think that's spot on. I mean, obviously, as creatives, we can try and define a style, we can try and yeah. define a brand, but it is the same with branding. Ultimately, it's the beholder that decides what that means. You know, it's, right. it's the market, it's the public that actually decide if that brand's effective and, and what message it kind of brings. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so and, and it's it's a, it's another one of those things that's super overnight thing. Like I, I've been drawing letters, doing I've been doing illustration and art for, I don't know, my whole life essentially, but then like design as a whole for maybe seven to eight years. And so like that window is a, is a decent amount of time to sort of figure out a lot about not only my design and my illustration, but a lot about myself and what I like, what I don't like. Um, so it's never just an overnight thing. It definitely takes like, you know, you got to put in your 10,000 hours essentially. <laughs> yeah, so that's for sure. Um, yeah. This is something we like to do because I know we're coming to the end of time here. You've been so uh, yeah. your advice, Scott, and such an incredible insight into your work. I would like that's everyone awesome. watching live in the comments to leave one emoji in the chat, which is their response to what they've seen today. Because this oh, is nice. what, yeah. I see what people come up with. <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to seeing these <laughs> Dude, a i need a lot of flame emojis that's what i need yeah yeah we need straight <laughs> fire for scott yeah. for you bring fire yeah oh there nice. we go we yeah flaming sheep. nice thank you nick <laughs> <laughs> got some rockets from chad cynthia got the strong arm got oh, no. yeah the snake nice snake. <laughs> nice. love it keep them coming guys <laughs> nice car there from matt nice all the fire happening. Thank Is that fire? You, that looks like tiny birds or something. Um, and also, while we got some of these coming in uh, with the delay, keep them coming, guys. I'm going to end with a random personal question, Scott. Okay, let's go. If you were hosting a dinner party, you might have had <laughs> before, uh, what three people are you sitting down with? And they can be oh alive. Oh, my gosh. Oh my goodness. Um, time while the emojis are coming in. Also, while Scott's thinking of that answer, definitely click the shiny green button below the video and go check out his portfolio, his website. He's got some more incredible. Oh, yes, work. please do. Um, okay, I, person number one, Paul Rudd. I can mm -hmm. easily say that without a doubt. Like, that dude seems super chill, super down to earth, like yep. just a hilarious guy. Um, that's, a, that's a good start. I mean, it's already a great dinner party if you've got Paul Rudd there. Yeah, exactly. I know that's all you need, really. <laughs> um, probably Leonardo DiCaprio. I really like the work that he's doing for the planet as a whole. Uh, sustainability, right. just being, you know, bringing that sort of knowledge to the forefront um, to a lot of people. Awesome. Um, uh, I'd be, I'd be curious to pick his brain on that stuff. And uh, I don't know who else. We're going heavy on the actors. Have we got any creatives in there? I know. I need it. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> bring it down somewhere. Um, let me think. I'm liking the emojis, think. by the way, guys. We, we got volcanoes and everything going on. Oh, awesome. Cool. Oh, um, man, it's so hard to be put on the spot like this. Yeah, I know. I thought I'd uh, end on a tough note. <laughs> okay, I'll, 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 give you a, I'll give you a slightly uh, smoother one to end. What are you guys okay. eating? You haven't talked about What am I eating? Or, like at this dinner party. Oh, at the... Oh, okay, okay. What was it, Tacho? Uh, <laughs> Pineapple pizza. Ooh. I'm going to be controversial. Pineapple pizza. Commercial. <laughs> <laughs> I love pineapple on pizza, and I'm not afraid of it. So I'll be honest. I'm a fan of a Hawaiian. So Yeah, I got I got to have that Hawaiian pizza. <laughs> cool. Um, Scott, is there anywhere else people should check you out? So your website, of course. Yeah, website, youbringfire.com. Instagram, youbringfire. Twitter, youbringfire. Everything you can think of, it's That's all you bring people. Fire. That's effective brand. <laughs> That's right. Scott, you were fantastic. Thank you so much for jumping on. Thank you, everyone, for being so active in the chat today and getting so involved. You guys were awesome, but hopefully we can keep in touch and we'd love to oh, for get, sure, yeah. get you on the main podcast at some point as well because I think you've got so much yeah. value to bring. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining me. And uh, thank you for uh, chit-chatting chit with me this whole time and, and obviously sharing, sharing everything with everyone. It's been great. No, of course. Love your work, man. And uh, yeah, let's keep in touch. Thanks again. All right, sounds good. Take care. Bye,